So this is Osearch. So this is Osearch's forty-fifth expedition here, primarily off the Outer Banks, out of the Moorhead City and Wrightsville Beach area, Onslow Bay. We've been seeing our white sharks up in this region for a number of years, kind of gather up a little bit before they head north because it's getting too hot in the southern part of the range and it's too cold around Cape Hatteras. So they kind of get pinched up into this region. And we see male and female white sharks up here of all sex classes, but we do see mature animals here. We have some samples from the past and we're really trying to understand what are the animals doing while they're here. And a big part of uh, the the nature of the question is to understand if mating is involved in what's going on up here this time of year, because it's the only region where with the few mature animals from here that we've had that indicates some level of maybe moving toward mating. So we're really trying to drill down that and understand that, but uh, that's been a big challenge because then you have to catch big mature animals. So we're having a great trip. We're seeing a lot of animals, but they're all subadult and juvenile animals. So that's not really helping us close the gap on the mating side of things. But on the rest of the size and sex classes, sorry, the ship's rolling. On the rest of the size and um, sex classes of the sharks, we're gaining invaluable information to understand what their life is here because they haven't been sampled in this region at this time. So kind of a two-tiered approach. The real big question is, is the mating occurring? Uh, the secondary thing is, you know, what are the sharks eating here? What's their physiological condition in, in regards to how we can compare that when we sample them up in the northern and southern parts of their range? So a lot of good getting done. Still waiting for those big mature animals to answer that real big question. Are they mating here? During this expedition, how many have you guys tagged? So far, we've sampled and captured, worked up and released four great white sharks. Uh, ranging between, uh, you know, eight and a half and 13 and a half feet. Um, we're really trying to find some of these animals that are over 14 feet. That's when they kind of are sexually mature when they're about 20 years old and 14 feet. So uh, we're still waiting to see those animals. We're seeing them on our tracker. Some of the larger animals we know are in this region that we're tracking on the, you know, the O-Search app. Um, but we're not seeing them when we're out here on the water as of yet. But we have seen sharks every day. I bet we've seen another four white sharks that were smaller. Some of them, we were actually trying to pull the baits away from them because we had two sharks on us and we were trying to sample the larger shark for the science team and pulling baits away from the smaller baits. So tremendous amount of life here, plenty of animals here, just trying to find those right ones. How far out do you have to, are, are you normally? We're seeing a, our best kind of area of life, you know, just between 10 and 20 miles offshore of the Southern Outer Banks. Uh, on this trip so far is where we've been seeing a lot of life right there, kind of, you know, where the inside edge of the Gulf Stream, sometimes it can be in a little bit tighter than that. But yeah, that's where we've seen the most uh, life on this particular trip. But, you know, right now we're working, you know, very close to the beach out off Cape Lookout, hiding from this wind that's coming out of the east. So we're, I don't know, a half a mile off the beach here, hiding behind this structure. How long have you been doing this? This is our 45th expedition. First one was back in 2007. So yeah, kind of a kind of a shocking number. I never, I guess that's where the gray comes in the beard here. I never uh, thought we'd be talking about our 45th expedition, but here we are, you know, trying to solve the last bit of the puzzle for the white sharks that live off the East Coast of the United States. We understand birthing. We understand the nursery and how they move and expand the range. We understand what they're eating when they're in the North and when they're in the South and in between. But this Carolina area has always been kind of the toughest part of the puzzle because the weather is so dynamic here and there's no islands or anything to move around to find lees to work. So you basically have a weather window that you've been given by the weather in the ocean or you can't work. And it changes so fast here out here that, uh, you know, sometimes in a three week trip, you, you know, you're real happy if you get five or six good workable days. So you've been doing this for 17 years. Do you ever lose the thrill of of capturing and tagging a good shark? Does it ever get old? Uh, well, you know, I, I would honestly say from the beginning, there's never really been a thrill associated with catching mm -hmm. a shark. You know, it's not like fishing when you handle these animals. You know, I'm talking goal. about more from the research side of things. Yeah, no, knowing knowing when you catch them, quote unquote. I mean, that's what you're you know you're out here yeah. for. Does it ever get old knowing that you can gather some great information? 
Yeah, no, I call it kind of the white shark slide. You know, when you're when you when you handle these animals, you're trying to get them into the cradle so that they almost don't even know they're captured. Right. You're going for zero stress level. And so when you do that and you get them in there and the scientists conduct the 24 research projects and then you see the animals swim away and everyone has 10 fingers and 10 toes, you get kind of and you know you've done good. You know, you have this kind of euphoric um, relief is how I would um, describe it. I call it the white shark slide. Uh, and no, that never goes away when you know, especially when you're down like this, this is a study which was a hundred shark study. And I believe we're on shark 91 or 92 now. And so um, now you really only get that relief. These, these scientists need big mature animals to understand this one last final question. And I'm sure there will be tremendous relief. You know, we're out here cranking through the subadults and the juveniles. We've done hundreds of those around the world. And it feels great because we're adding to the body of knowledge. We're helping young PhD students collect data to get their PhDs that are coming up through the ranks. Our senior people are helping them. And all that feels great. Um, but there will be nothing like the relief when we've delivered two to four more mature animals from this region to the science team, because that will be the relief of conducting the biggest white shark research project in history that's gathered more information than anyone in history for the future of our resource. So kind of tough. I mean, there's like, there's no shortage of animals, but we need, we're down to where we need a specific animal or two, which makes a very difficult task, infinitely yeah. more difficult. What will this last piece of the puzzle do to help preserve the species? Well, we're we're already in good shape, I think, when it comes to preserving the white sharks off the East Coast. We have good momentum from management that's been in place for the last 20 or 30 years where we're trickling. It was really bad, right? We were down to single digit percentages, and now we're probably in the teen percentages of what we should have. Um, and so this last piece of the puzzle for their what what we call the life history of the animal, the life history, right? You want to understand its full migratory range. You understand its birthing. You want to understand the primary nursery so you can look after the babies and how that nursery expands. That's actually the most important part of bringing them back. We've already done that work. And then the final one is, you know, understanding where they mate and gestate because you obviously don't want to accidentally open a fishery on top of the mating site uh, for the animals that are the balance keepers for the whole system. So that that's what would happen. I mean, we, we are trending the right way, right? So I'm very, I think under the current level of pressure that we see on these animals off the East Coast of the United States, we're winning, right? So I think it's important for people to understand that. So, you know, we need our commercial fisheries, we need our recreational fisheries, and we need to look after the fish in a way so that our kids are gonna see an abundant ocean, right? A centrist path. Um, and we're already on that path right now. What we need to do is understand mating in this part of the world to make sure we don't accidentally open a fishery that could crush these animals because they have to wait 20 years to mate. They have to live for 20 years before they can replace themselves. So they're hugely susceptible to any interruption in the mating or in the nursery area. Like you can just collapse the population because they can't replace themselves. And that's what we did in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so now we're coming back from that and we're trending the right way. This ocean out here is more abundant now than it's been since the 50s or 60s when it comes to the fish, the whales, the sharks. I mean, we're winning. It's a, it's a, that's the real story in the Atlantic is the return to abundance, the rewilding of, of what we're giving to our children. And so we need to understand mating here just to, just to make sure we don't accidentally open a fishery that could be a big problem. Now, in other parts of the world, you got to find the mating site because you got to immediately protect it because there's almost. And you got to immediately protect it because there's almost none left. So it there's nine white shark puzzles around the world. This is the first one in history that will be fully described because of this project, which means we have the data set to manage our balance keeper and move the whole system toward abundance and be stoked on what we deliver to our grandchildren. This is the only one of the nine where that has been completed. This is a first. And this, this mating site, if we can locate it, will be the first mating site in the world ever identified for a white shark population. So it's hugely important for this region. Sorry, man, the ship's rolling around. I think that adds to the fun, we're good. So, 
so it's an important thing for this region, but more importantly, everything we've accomplished in this one life history puzzle, this first one of the nine that will be fully described, we can then take the, the, the talent and the ship to these other regions. And instead of having it cost, you know, $15 million and take seven years to figure it out, we can take the pattern we've uncovered, apply that to those places and hopefully solve those puzzles in a few years for less than half that money and give that gift to those regions because they're going to have to do the things we did 30 years ago if they want their kind of oceans to recover. You know, we made some key moves. You know, everyone knows about the Marine Mammal Protection Act 50 years ago where we started protecting our whales and our seals. That's worked. They are back. We have a few challenges with the odd species or two, but generally speaking, winning, right? So then around the 90s and 90s, early to mid 90s, we see our shark populations have collapsed and there's no fish, right? In a lot of areas of the world. So we start bringing back our shark populations and protect sharks in the 90s. You got to realize some of these animals aren't going to have babies for 20 years, right? So it's a slow going thing. So we do that in the 90s. Then also, we got rid of our inshore gill nets in the late 80s and early 90s with, because the recreational fishery had collapsed. No one was buying boats. No one was chartering boats because people couldn't catch a fish. And that stretched all the way from the northeastern United States down through Florida. It was stripers up north, redfish in the mid-Atlantic down through here, and snook down below and everything in between. When we got those gill nets out, we started to see the slow recovery of our game fish. Unbeknownst to ourselves at the time, when we removed the gill nets from the south shore of Long Island in the Jersey coast, we were removing the gill nets from the birthing site of the great white shark. So our white sharks were being whacked before they ever made it to one year old. We were gill netting the birthing site. So then you see 20 years later, 2010 or so, we start to see some large mature white sharks showing up in the Northeast on seal colonies about 20 years later. About five years ago or six years ago, up in the Northeast in particular, they started to understand if we're going to bring the whales back and the seals back and the big sharks and the game fish back, we have to start looking after what they eat. Believe it or not, everything wasn't managed as a system. It was managed as a species. So we can't end up with a bunch of skinny whales and a bunch of skinny sharks, right? So they started to really look after the menhaden up there, which I believe down here you either call bunky, a bunker, or pogey. It's a bait fish. It's so it's really its real name is a manhaden. They call them bunker up north. I think it's pokey down here. So they started to protect the forage fish. You couldn't, you could no longer commercially harvest them in state waters, which meant they had to go outside of three miles. So now you have this system colliding on the East Coast where the menhaden are exploding up and down the East Coast. Everything that's come back that we've managed back is foraging on that and the ocean is thriving. I mean, we're seeing things we haven't seen since the 40s, 50s, or 60s. It's a phenomenal story on the return to the abundance of the white shark. And it really is the model for the world. So um, the description of the white shark is the balance keeper of that whole system. If you have that data set, you can manage that system and move it toward abundance because if those large sharks are thriving, the system's thriving just like lions or wolves. So um, that's what's going on here. It's the blueprint to be applied to the rest of the world. And hopefully we can collapse the time because a lot of those places are in urgent situations where the challenge were, are, is going to be finding the one of the few that's left versus describing and understand their pattern here in the midst of this slow, steady recovery. We're winning. We're going to win this one. Our kids are going to see an ocean full of fish. They're going to eat fresh fish sandwiches off the East Coast of the United States. And it's something that should be celebrated. And it, it has a lot to do with the return of the shark and excellent management moves that have been made over the last 30 years or so. Cool. That was that answer to my next question about people. A lot of people are just terrified of sharks and they would ask why you do this, but they play such an important role in the ecosystem. So in the midst of an ecosystem like that, that's recovering right up in the Northeast, you have all of these seals recovering and the gray seal, believe it or not, in its historic range is going to stretch all the way down here as far south as uh, Cape Hatteras, believe it or not. And right now they started reestablishing the range since we've protected them. They've moved back down out of Canada. We have them stretched out now. They've come around Montauk. It used to be they were only at Cape Cod. Now they're around Montauk and they're coming down the Jersey Shore. And this population of seals, you know, they reproduce at 50% per year. 
And so they're going to reestablish that range in the next 10 or 20 years. They're going to be back down here in the Carolinas. If your white sharks are present, one white shark swimming up and down the beach in front of all those seals prevents all of those seals from going into the water to overforage. If those white sharks aren't there, that population of seals, every single one of them eats four times more fish per day. So they wipe out all the stripers, all the cod, all the redfish, all the crabs, the lobster up north, you name it, right? So these big sharks are actually the guardians of our fish stocks in a healthy, abundant system, which is what we're returning to. So if they're not thriving, we're not eating fish. That's the bottom line. And then down here, the sharks, you know, as you get further south below where the marine mammals are, that deep scattering layer that migrates every night when a squid come into the surface. If the sharks aren't present, that that layer wipes out all the fry, all the baby billfish, all the baby tarpon, all the baby tuna, all the baby mahi. And then there's nothing to grow up for us to eat. So I think the biggest misconception about sharks in general is people are afraid of them and they their primary role is to actually guard our fish stocks so there's stuff for us to eat. And and more and more people understand that everything is connected and 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 it's just the story of the East Coast is is not a story that's been told the way it should and I think it's because it's uh, it's because the nonprofit community they, they knows that it doesn't rain unless the sky is falling. And, you know, the victim in the middle of that conversation is young people who think our planet's going in the wrong direction and that there's no reason for them to build a family and create a future because there's not going to be anything left anyway. And that's not what's happening here. They have a bright future ahead of them and a robust resource around them. And they should be building their lives just like we were when we were young because we didn't have to worry about things like that. And they shouldn't be either, particularly in this part of the world. So we, we need to celebrate what's going on out here. A big part of that's the return of the white shark. From, from a non-scientific side, and we can end it on this, uh, and I'll have, ask if you want to add something at the end. So when you get these sharks on, uh, what do you, if you call it a trough or a lift or whatever, I mean, yeah, have you ever had a close call where you were out there thinking, yeah, this is not a this is not a happy fish, and you know th this could be trouble. No, not from the sharks. You know they're super docile in the cradle. They have this condition called learned helplessness, which means for the most part they just lay there until it's over and swim away. The, you know the the single biggest challenges and and dangerous things we face out here is weather and listening to the ocean and 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 and, and moving when she's giving you signals to go in and hide. And, you know, the old saying, it's, you know, I'd rather be at the dock wishing I was out there than be out there wishing I was at the dock. So, um, you know, listening to the ocean in big waves, big wind, big weather is by far the most dangerous thing we face out here. And we try to stay well, well ahead of that. Just re-explain what happens to the sharks when they get in that cradle, because people see your, your videos and your pictures are like, I can't believe someone's standing that close to a shark in water. Um, Explain to me again what happens to them when they get in those situations. Yeah, so each shark is, you know, will come in and pick up a set of gear. And when, when we capture these animals, it's not really like catching a fish. It's more like teaching a dog how to heal. Uh, you know, it's all hand lines. And you're really, your goal is to get the shark back into the cradle and have it not know it was caught. Right? So, like, when we see a shark walking off with a bait, you know, we'll go up with it and just try to not let it know that we have a hold of the other end of the line. And then if it's swimming away, we'll just try to put a little bit of pressure in the corner of the animal's mouth and actually get it to swim into a turn and just let it swim back to the ship. And then once it gets back to the ship, we'll put buoys in front of its mouth so it can't dive under the lift when we go in, and then we'll pull it into the lift. And these animals have this condition called learned helplessness, which they leverage in uh, aquariums and zoos and, and managed care all over, uh, which means if they know they can't get away, they give up. It's the same kind of condition that a baby has when you swaddle it and it finally gives up and stops crying. It's called learned helplessness. Sharks, a lot of species of sharks have the same type of characteristic. So we've been able to get the, the, you know, the watermen and the scientists to work together to understand how can we maximize the characteristic of learned helplessness within these animals to get them into the cradle and through the process and almost have it so that they don't even know it or weren't even affected. So once the animal comes into the cradle, um, it'll be centered in the cradle by breath then it comes up out of the water, hose goes in its mouth so it can breathe, a towel goes over its eyes. This just kind of makes them go real mellow. 
like a fish on the deck if you get a towel over its eyes. These things, um, and particularly because of the towel and learned helplessness and their breathing, they just kind of lay there. While that occurs, we'll go about then 24 different research projects in about 15 minutes. Everything from ultrasounds to blood samples, semen samples, bacteria samples, the application of three tags, bacterial samples and all the morphometrics. And then we'll drop the animal back in in around 15 minutes and uh, let it swim away. And then it from there, every time it sticks its fin out of the water, people can track it at the OSEARCH free app or at OSEARCH.org because there's real time tracking for everyone to follow the animals. I'm on there three times a week at least. What what, what can people do? What can people do to uh, to help you guys? Well, you know, it's you know, they can always go to the OSearch app or website and buy some merch, you know, or make a donation. That helps us a lot to pay for these sort of things. Um, also, I think you know, really for everyone, the one thing we can all do is just try to lead the most efficient, clean life we can. Try to minimize the amount of garbage that each one of us produces, you know, even if that's just being efficient when you order a meal from a restaurant with your family. So there's not constant packaging and excess food being thrown away and, and that sort of thing. If we're all leading a pretty clean and efficient life and not generating a bunch of extra waste, I think that that's the best thing we can all do for the planet. Because sometimes I find myself that there's so much waste and so much that my family's producing that I'm like, we got to do better. I mean, this is kind of a disgusting amount of waste, you know? Um, and I think that's an area that everyone in their life, what I've started doing with my kids, you know, we got a big family. If we go out with five of us, I only order three meals because every time I order five, there's enough food for eight people or nine people. And I end up taking home food and throwing it away and cartons and throwing them away. We've gotten into like trying to buy as much food as we all want to eat, but not anymore. And that's been incredible in our household because I'm not bringing weed out almost every evening. <laughs> I'm a single dad and my yeah. kids want to come home and, uh, and, and at least part of the time. And, uh, and so I've been working hard on just minimizing the amount of garbage and extra food that, that we waste in my household. And I think if everybody did that, that's a good place to start because I don't know, you start to kind of, once you start to become aware of it and you focus on a little bit, kind of becomes a little bit of a game and you end up saving a bunch of money too. Just as we, as we follow this expedition and whatever the research shows, are there any uh, that you're aware of? Are there any local researchers who are taking part in this? I know, oh, yeah, EC, we, I know ECU has a big, uh, a big group out there. Yeah, we always engage uh, with, uh, you know, we got several people in North Carolina. Emily's out here right now. We're doing some stuff with uh, the aquarium. Um, I don't have the list in front of me. There's a lot of people rotating through here. But, yes, yeah. we have people all, all through this region. You know, the, the science team that's doing the 25 projects is made up of 49 scientists from 25 different research institutions. So even if they're not out here collecting a sample, a sample is going to them. And what we tried to do is we tried to build out that team across the entire range of the white shark. You know, we got people from Canada, we got people from Florida, people from the Gulf and all people through this region, you know, as well, because those are the scientists you know, off the shores in which these animals are living at some point during the year. So, yeah, no, we got excellent representation, I believe, through here on the science team. Cool. Well, good luck on the rest of the expedition. I hope you catch those uh, fleeting couple that you need. And yeah, uh, big ones, and the scientists would be overjoyed. All of us would be. I'll be uh, keeping tabs on Facebook and uh, the tracker to see what you guys get. Thanks. Have Great. a good one. Thanks, Chris.